Good morning. Welcome to the BYU Real Estate Webinar Series. My name is Barrett Slade, Professor of Finance, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our first webinar of the season. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to announce that in two weeks on September 16th, I'll be hosting Julie Kilgore, President of Wasatch Environmental. She'll be teaching us about environmental due diligence in the real estate transactions. Uh, we'll be sending out an invitation to that webinar in the next few days. Please note that after our guest speaker concludes at 11.35 a.m. Mountain Daylight Time, we'll have about 10 minutes for Q&A, and then we'll conclude at 11.45 a.m. If you have questions for the speaker, please click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type in your question. So today we have with us Mr. Michael Acton, who is Managing Director and Head of Research for AW. He has over 35 years of experience as an economic analyst and forecaster. He is a graduate of Bates College and a CFA charter holder, as well as a member of the CFA Institute and CFA Society of Boston. Mike, it's so good to see you again. Thank you so much for joining us and giving us an update on the real estate markets. And uh, you now have the floor. Proceed. All right, great. Thank you, Barry. Thanks for inviting me to kick off the series this year. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here quickly. Um, welcome, everyone. Here we go. Uh, full screen. All right, can everybody see that? Bear, can yes. you see that? Yes. Okay, We're perfect. Ready. Great. So, the title this morning is The Great American Reopening Moving Beyond COVID. I got to say, when I started putting these um, slides together a couple months ago uh, for, the, for the summer season here, um, I had a lot more confidence in this title uh, than I most recently have added the question mark to it. I think we all understand uh, the pandemic is still with us. Um, as the title here says, we might be done with it, but it's not entirely done with us yet. Uh, the numbers are really bad. There's no way to get around it in some parts of the country. Having said that though, there's not a lot of evidence that many parts of the country are doing uh, much in terms of restricting movement, restricting um, the economy the way we might have earlier uh, in this whole event. So. The new infections, I think everyone knows, they're mostly happening in areas that are largely, um, much larger numbers of unvaccinated. Uh, those are the areas that are being hardest hit, um, but everybody's getting it a little bit. N you know, hopefully schools are still on course to open normally, and that's, a, that's really a threshold issue for a lot of workers. A lot of people's ability to go back to work, participate normally in the economy really is dependent on their children uh, resuming life uh, more or less normally. So we're, we're still, cautiously optimistic that this is going to continue to happen. Um, and if it does, we still feel that most workers, not all, of course, but most workers will eventually be returning uh, to their offices, to their places of business and so on. But there's a lot of disruption to get through along the way. And I'll, I'll try to speak to that. Um, the second big point here is really about the economy and stimulus in particular. Uh, I think everyone on the call knows that back in February, um, the House and the Senate passed a very, very large spending bill, almost $2 trillion. They seem to be on the cusp of passing a traditional infrastructure bill, uh, which would be roughly the same size again, and then uh, possibly passing uh, what is known as the social infrastructure, the, the Family Act, uh, which would be another $3 trillion of spending. So there's a lot of stimulus in the system and likely a lot more coming. That's all to the good as far as economic growth uh, reaccelerating. I'll, I'll speak to that in just a second. Uh, but of course, it causes much higher inflation concerns. And the Fed did, um, did react to this a bit last week at the virtual Jackson Hole. They did announce that they're going to begin tapering their bond purchasing uh, by the end of this year. Now, keep in mind, tapering bond purchasing is a very, very different thing than actually tightening monetary policy. So we'll, we'll try to get into that a little bit more. The recovery is, is well underway in most parts of the country, but it varies considerably. Uh, by geography, by industry, um, by, by uh, property type even. So we'll, we'll get into that in a minute as well. Um, obviously the COVID downturn hit places much harder than other places that filtered through to the property markets. So the recovery from that, of course, is gonna be quite variable as well. Leaving all of that aside, there's an enormous amount of capital today trying to invest in real estate. There's a, a literally a wall of capital coming. I'll try to quantify some of that for you. And against that backdrop, it is still one of the few places, property is still one of the few places where our investors feel like they can get attractive current yields, uh, rel particularly relative to corporate bonds. And I'll, I'll speak about that a little bit more in a minute as well. 
Um, you know, the, the reopening is highly variable, as I said. Um, one measure of this uh, on the left-hand side here, Moody's put together uh, an index about a year ago. They call it their back to normal index. It's 37 distinct economic measures. Some of them are regular government data releases and some of them are new uh, sort of real-time data like mobility data and things like that. At any rate, today, the most back to normal state, and I'm not, not even showing it on the chart here, the most back to normal state is actually South Dakota. Uh, economic activity, in South Dakota is actually well above pre-pandemic levels. It didn't down, turn, turn down very much at all. Of the major states, New York is bringing up the rear, um, still lagging quite a bit. Florida was way out in the lead uh, earlier on, but look, most recently, Florida has actually backpedaled a bit uh, with the pandemic and so on. And the US as a whole has really sort of flattened out the last few weeks. On the right-hand side, um, one of the other new data sets that people have been using during the pandemic time, this is just people dining in restaurants. It comes, uh, comes from Open Table, a uh, restaurant reservation company. And no surprise, places in the South, Southwest, uh, places like Vegas and Miami and Tampa and San Antonio, uh, restaurant reservations, restaurant dining is well above where it was in the same week in 2019. And then down at the bottom, places like New York, Seattle, San Francisco, no surprise, they're lagging quite a bit behind. New Orleans is a really interesting case because prior to about two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, um, New Orleans was quite a bit above uh, its pre-pandemic uh, levels of, of, of in-person dining. But the, the, the infection numbers have been so bad in Louisiana, and, and this data actually predates the hurricane, um, the, the infections have been so bad that restaurant dining has really, really dropped off. It, it was well above 100 before, now it's well, uh, well below 100. Uh, just moving along, uh, I often get asked uh, when I'm speaking to groups of why the stimulus is so big, why are we spending so much money? It seems like the economy is coming back. Well, the short answer is, is we're still down more than 6 million jobs from where we were in February of 2020. That's what this red line is showing you. The blue line is the trend rate of employment growth before the pandemic happened. So when you factor that in, we're, we're closer to 10 million jobs below where we really should be. And if there was one lesson that was learned by policymakers from the financial crisis period, it was do too much, not too little to get the economy back to full employment. In the, in the coming out of the financial crisis period, we, we actually had a very small uh, response uh, in, in actual dollar terms, about half as much as is currently been spent. And we spent almost 10 years trying to get back to full employment. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of things wrong with that. A lot of social problems, a lot of political problems, economic problems, and so on. Um, interestingly enough today on the right-hand side, the US economy has more than 10 million open positions, uh, more than at any point since this data started being collected uh, in 2000. And there's actually more than one job right now for every person who is uh, reported as unemployed. So there's a, there's a great churn going on in our labor market. There's a great mismatch between jobs that are available and jobs that people want. It'll get sorted out, but it is gonna take a while for, uh, for that to happen. Um, at a very macro level, the economy is, is very much responding in a V-shape. Um, this is very different than what we would have said uh, before the stimulus bill got passed in February. Uh, we thought it was going to take much longer to get back on pre-pandemic GDP trend. Uh, the way it looks right now, uh, we're, all, we're already back to the pre-pandemic GDP level. We'll get back to trend growth uh, by the end of this year, beginning of next year. And, and then moving on. But as I said at the beginning, the, the variation in outlook is as large as I can remember. I've been doing uh, macro and regional forecasting for about 35 years, and I can't remember a time uh, coming out of an economic downturn when the models were suggesting that the variation in performance by geography would be this great. Uh, econometric models, I think a lot of people on this call know, tend to be somewhat mean reverting. And that's not what's happening today. Um, places like Boston and Salt Lake and Dallas, the, the southern warmer climate, better weather, lower costs, lower tax areas of the country were outperforming uh, for most of the past 10 years. But the forecast is suggesting that they're going to outperform at an even greater pace than the what I'll call the older and colder places, the Chicago's, the Pittsburgh, Detroit, Cleveland's, and so on. You know, places with bad weather, high taxes, high costs, high legacy um, structural costs like unfunded pension systems and things like that. So that difference is probably going to get greater. Um, that does lead people to say, well, why would I ever invest in Chicago then? Well, you know, the short story is, is you can make money in a lot of markets for a lot of different reasons. Um, it's always great to have growth at your back. But even when you don't, 
uh, it is still very possible to, to make uh, strong returns. And I'm just showing you here that the case of New York City, this is just the five boroughs of New York, not the whole metro area. Total employment in the city of New York peaked in 1969 at the peak of the Vietnam War, and then fell for about six or seven years right after that. It never returned to that pre-1970 uh, peak until right before the financial crisis. That's what this red line is showing you. And then after the financial crisis, of course, New York just erupted in growth, uh, adding over a million jobs in the 10 years between the end of the financial crisis and the pandemic. The blue line here is the NACREF property capital value index, again, just for those same five boroughs. And you can see every time that employment turned down in New York uh, from you know, the uh, mid 70s all the way up through to the beginning of the financial crisis, people who invested in New York at those localized troughs made a lot of return, a lot of capital value uh, growth uh, on their investments uh, in the city. So it's not just about the actual level of jobs or the pace of jobs. It really goes far beyond that to uh, what's really going on in those jobs. Are they creating wealth, in other words? Um, now, just quickly on inflation, I titled this chart, Negative Real Yields Forever, just trying to be provocative here. The bond market today expects inflation over the next five years to average about two and a half percent. This is a big change for most of the post-financial crisis period. Um, Fed Chairman Powell last August gave a speech at Jackson Hole, virtual Jackson Hole, just, just like this year, where he said the Fed was going to change its policy. They were going to let inflation move above 2% for some period of time to offset the time it had been below 2%. And the bond market has really pretty much taken them at their word. Uh, again, expected inflation is, is the highest it's been now since before the financial crisis, 2.5%. Not outrageous inflation, but quite a bit higher uh, than where it had been. Um, the bond market in the middle chart is also saying that the 10-year treasury yield now, today, is not going to move above 2% over the next decade. This is the forward curve for the treasury, 10-year uh, treasury yield. Now, the big change is going on here. July 2020, before Powell's speech, that line was down around 1%. Following Powell's, Powell's speech and with the experience of, of an elevated CPI over the last handful of months, that moved all the way out to 2.5% in May. And now it has reverted back down uh, in August to 2%. If both of those charts are correct, the bond market saying that we're going to have negative real yields for the next decade. That's an extraordinary thing to say. And it makes the job of our pension clients all the harder. They just can't find yield. I think the bond market is not reacting particularly strong to the recent inflation numbers because they're looking at the right-hand side chart. It has the year-over-year -year growth of the core inflation index, CPI, and it also has a measure that the Dallas Fed creates called the trim mean inflation. And what, what they do is the Fed, Dallas Fed looks at all the categories that, that the government tracks inflation data for, and they throw out everything in both of the tails. Uh, so basically they throw out the top 25% and the bottom 25% and really trying to get to a central tendency type measure for inflation. And that really isn't showing any of the things that people are worried about today. So yes, there's labor disruption. There's not true labor shortage, there's labor market disruption. Yes, we've had a lot of shortages in commodities and certain, uh, certain finished goods. Obviously there's a, there's a shortage of used cars today and things like that. But, uh, but our, our market economy will sort all of that out in short order. Um, one need only look at lumber prices today. Lumber prices are measured in uh, dollars per thousand board feet. Prior to the pandemic, that was about $400. During the pandemic, when the lumber mills shut down and then housing demand really soared, that went up to about $1,600. And now it's back below 400 again. So it's gone full circle in less than a year. Um, I think a lot of other categories are likely to do the same. Um, turning to property markets here, um, I said at the beginning that we have a lot of investors who are really interested in yield. So the chart on the left-hand side here is showing the spread between the NACREF average cap rate for all properties to the 10-year treasury yield. Um, the gold line is the average for the last 20 years, right at 250 basis points. So today we're quite a bit above that in terms of spread. More importantly, a lot of our yield clients, our, our German insurance company clients, our Japanese uh, bank and life insurance companies, they really look at this as a ratio rather than a spread. And it's probably a little bit more helpful to look at it that way. I, I haven't put it on here, but the 10-year treasury today is well below 1.5%. Two and a half, um, 250 basis points is an enormous amount of yield pickup on a base rate that's below 150 basis points. It's, it's, it's the, the rate today, uh, the NACREF cap rate today is roughly three times the treasury rate. So we have a lot of capital 
coming into property today that's looking for yield. The middle chart is data from Precoin tracking dry powder capital in uh, private equity real estate funds that have already been raised. There's about $225 billion today that's already been committed that's waiting to be called to be invested. These funds are largely in opportunistic value add and debt strategies. I think that's interesting. Those are return seeking strategies largely, but more importantly, they are finite investment period vehicles. All of this money has to get invested over the next two or three years per the terms of these fund documents, and, and it will. Um, so there's a lot of capital pressure supporting property price in the United States. And then on the right-hand side, the, the newest player in the game, if you will, is the, um, this rapid, rapid growth in capital being raised by what are called non-traded REITs. Um, these are the REITs that are being raised by groups like Blackstone and uh, KKR and Starwood and, and groups like that. Um, right now on a trailing 12-month uh, basis, they're raising more than $20 billion a year. This is expected to accelerate through this year and into next to an annual pacing of closer to $30 billion. And this is capital that is um, very much needs to be put out. As soon as they raise it, it starts counting against their return. Um, so there's a lot of pressure to put this money out as well. And they are becoming a very, very aggressive buyers of core assets in almost every market that we operate in today. So the, the short story here is that there's a lot of capital um, moving into real estate uh, and, and that's not gonna change anytime soon. As far as the pacing of this capital goes, this is transaction volume throughout the year, cumulative transaction volume for 2018, 19 and 20, and then what's happened so far this year. Um, capital pacing this year is right on top of where it was in 18 and 19. It actually started out ahead last year and then went sideways when people couldn't uh, actually go visit assets and tour properties and so on. Uh, we finished the year last year about $200 billion below the pacing of 2018 and 2019. And I think for people listening, it's probably important to remember that there's all kinds of agents and actors in the real estate market that only get paid when things trade. Um, think like brokers and appraisers and so on like that. So uh, there's a lot of institutional pressure within those organizations to, to get capital pacing back up. And, and it is, and in certain sectors, it's running way ahead. So in the middle, we have the same exact concept, only just for industrial properties. You can see that that capital pacing is way ahead of the 18 and 19 levels. And then on the right-hand side, apartments. Um, those are the sectors, obviously, that are most uh, popular with investors today, where there's the most conviction around cash flows uh, that you can underwrite and so on. If I were to show you this for office and retail and hotels, it's, it's quite a bit below uh, prior year pacing. Um, just briefly on lending, uh, the lending market today is incredibly robust. We can borrow um, on, on high quality assets, well leased assets. We can borrow at incredibly favorable terms at very, very low interest, interest rates that are extremely accretive, even with the yield compression that's been going on in the space. So on the left-hand side, uh, this is the Fed's survey, quarterly survey of senior loan officers at Fed member banks. Um, those loan offers are, are reporting universally, they're reporting an increase in demand for commercial real estate credit. And then on the right-hand side, it's those same lending officers talking about whether they're tightening or loosening credit conditions. And they've moved very uh, abruptly over the past year into loosening credit conditions uh, for property loans. So very, very buoyant lending market. Um, this next page is titled, has distress already peaked? Again, trying to be a little provocative here. A lot of that capital that I showed a couple pages back had been raised in anticipation of there being a lot of distress to take advantage of. Um, you know, same thing happened in the financial crisis period. That really isn't happening though. The, the, the distress, there is some distress out there, but it's not anywhere near as much as may have been anticipated. The chart on the left-hand side here is showing um, CMBS loan delinquency rates by property type. This is through July. And yes, there was definitely distress in hotels. There was definitely distress in some parts of the retail uh, property market, but that distress largely peaked in the fourth quarter of last year and has gradually been coming down uh, since then. The data on the right-hand side is uh, similar. It's the share of CMBS loans by property type that are in special servicing. Again, very large jump up in hotels and retail, um, but then again, trending back down. For the most part, if a property has made it this far, it's probably gonna make it um, you know, with the economy uh, restarting and so on. It, it would probably take another really big 
um, pandemic related shutdown, government shutdown, in order to uh, make this go back the other way, particularly for hotels and for shopping centers. Um, I mentioned earlier that there was a lot of variation in property type performance, and hopefully this chart will speak to it for you. On the left hand side, uh, we have indices of net operating income by property type. I set them equal to the end of 2018 to equal 100, just so you can see what had been happening in the period leading right up to the pandemic, and then of course through the pandemic period. Um, retail is clearly the, the uh, outlier in terms of impact, but do keep in mind that retail NOI, retail values, that's in the middle chart, they were under pressure even before uh, the pandemic hit. Uh, the pandemic of course made it all worse, so very sharp decline in net operating income, uh, somewhat smaller decline in values. Um, starting to have a recovery here, retail starting to come up off the floor, apartments are bouncing back pretty well. It is interesting, um, office and industrial properties really didn't show any downturn in net operating income. Office values in the middle stayed flat, industrial values went straight up, uh, much like the NOI. Over on the right-hand side, I also added in data from Real Capital Analytics. This is their, their version of repeat sales indices for uh, the different property types. You can think of these as being very similar to the Case-Shiller indices for single family residential uh, prices. And you see apartments in industrial up and to the right, uh, office still up, a little bit of a dip, and then retail, um, in, their, in their measure, retail is back to pre-pandemic levels in terms of pricing. Um, maybe uh, owners didn't see that in capital return. They probably had to put a lot of capital into the properties that, that traded. Then if we dig a little bit more into apartment and retail, since they were the ones that had the most impact, I just broke it out by types of apartment and types of retail. The really big impact in apartment in Hawaii was really felt in the high rise apartment buildings. These are the CBD towers, the big shiny new towers that got built all across the country in urban areas. That's where people pulled back from during pandemic. People moved back into the suburbs. They moved back with family. They went to families' vacation homes and things like that. And those, those properties really suffered a lot. Not so much in garden. There was really almost no impact in garden properties at all. And they're actually coming back very, very strong. In the retail space, the real impact was in the malls, uh, regional and super regional malls. Not so much in neighborhood and community centers, the grocery anchor centers. Uh, we, we managed some... Um, some uh, regional malls uh, for, for one client of ours. And we have one in California that the state of California kept closed 150 days last year. So you can imagine it's very, very difficult for the tenants in that environment when, this, when the, the building isn't even open at all. So hopefully we're not going back to that. I don't think we are. Um, in the office space, you're not seeing it in the NOI yet. You're not seeing it in the value. So we have to actually look at the physical property market to maybe anticipate what's going to happen. So we've seen a big increase going from left to right, a big increase in the direct vacancy rate, bigger increase downtown than in the suburbs. I think that makes sense. In the middle, the availability rate, so taking the direct vacancy and then the space that, that is gonna be available or is available for sublease, and you get a much higher number. Again, much bigger increase in the downtown uh, than in the suburbs. Um, but interestingly, the downtown and the suburbs are about, uh, about the same today um, in terms of whichever measure of vacancy you, you wanna use. The place where they're pretty different, though, is in the sublease category. There's a much larger amount of sublease available in the downtown markets than in the suburban markets. And this is, the, if you're going to be uh, have something that you want to be concerned about uh, in terms of go forward impact, I think the impact of this sublease space on rents in CBD markets is something to be uh, concerned about and aware about. In my mind, sublease space puts more pressure on rents than direct vacancy does. If, if I have a tenant in one of my buildings that's trying to uh, lease space and I'm trying to lease space, that tenant's more likely than not going to undercut me on rent because they are really trying to minimize a cost and obligation that they have. Whereas as the owner of the building, I'm really trying to maximize return uh, for my investors. Uh, so I'm, I'm a profit maximizer. They're a cost minimizer. I think they win the day on, on rent in that situation. So uh, this data only goes back um, to um, the, um, the tech crash, that's as far back as the sublease um, availability data goes, uh, but it's as high today as it was in, in the uh, aftermath of the tech downturn in the early 2000s. Now, just, um, just briefly before we get to the, um, to the, to the end here, uh, I always 
take a look at what the public market is telling me about private market pricing and, and vice versa for that matter. So on the left-hand side, we have a very simple comparison. We've got the NACREF capital value index, that's the red line. And we have the, the US REIT share price index, equity REIT share price index. They're not exactly the same concept, but they move together over time in a very specific way. As you can see back in the financial crisis period, the REIT market, the blue line, sold off really sharply and quickly uh, about a year before the private market actually started adjusting values. And by the time the red line bottomed out, the blue line, the REIT market was already recovering. Though do note, it took about five years for the REIT market to get all the way back to the pre-financial crisis uh, valuations. And then you look forward to the very end of that line. The REIT market sold off sharply in March of last year, uh, bottomed out early in the summer, and then has completely recovered. And it's well above uh, pre-pandemic levels. And the private market is taking a, a, a cue, if you will, from that small adjustment in capital values in the private market, seemingly over. And the expectations, I'll get to this in just a second, but the expectations are that these numbers are going up from here, not down. So the events, the events all over, the National Bureau of Economic Research declared that the recession lasted two months and, it's, and we've been in recovery since uh, last May and the property markets seem to be saying the same thing. On the right-hand side, the bond market is confirming all of this. Um, property yields, commercial property cap rates track over time pretty well with corporate bond yields. And I, I think that makes a lot of sense. If you have a multi-tenanted office building or industrial building or shopping center, the, the, each tenant is just a little corporate credit that you have. The lease is, a, is a, uh, analogous to, to a little corporate bond. And they should sort of move together over time. And, and they have through past cycles. So again, when you look back at the financial crisis period, corporate bond yields widened out. Uh, about a year later, property yields went up and then corporate bond yields started coming back down and then they met with property yields and continued more or less apace until we get to today where corporate bond yields are, are pretty far within inside of where property yields are. So to me, the bond market's saying that at least from a yield perspective, property's priced pretty fairly. Um, and then if we just, um, I guess we'll just finish with a forward looking uh, exhibit here. This is the second quarter PREA, Pension Real Estate Association, PREA um, consensus forecast survey for property returns. They ask all of the investment managers in the, in the universe here uh, what they think is gonna happen over the next five years. And when this survey was, was released, it was a 6% or so unlevered total return for NACREF made up of really substantially, mostly income and a little bit of appreciation and um, varies a lot by property type, much stronger outlook for industrial apartment, much weaker outlook for office and retail. I think that all, all makes sense. Um, we just finished uh, submitting our, our responses for uh, the third quarter survey. And I can't say what everyone else did, but I raised our expected return uh, for, for NACREF uh, for this time period by about 50 basis points largely as a result of that, of that downward movement in the forward yield curve. If, if yields are really gonna be lower, let's say 2% over the next decade, negative real yields, there's gonna be more room for cap rate compression. And that, that is confirmed as well by the borrowing costs we have today, which are substantially inside of where cap rates are today. Um, on a floating rate basis today, we can very frequently borrow at 150 to 180 basis points over LIBOR on stabilized assets. So I think it all makes sense. I think property, um, those returns might not necessarily be exactly what a pension needs to make um, to satisfy its liabilities, but it's gonna be very, very competitive return with equities and fixed income, at least I believe. So Barrett, I, I went through a lot of stuff very quickly there, um, finished at the 130 mark here. I think, um, I think we could uh, take some questions. Thanks, Mike. Uh, that was tremendous. Let's go ahead and uh, open it up to questions from the audience. Go ahead and fire those in if you can. In the meantime, I'd like to just share with you um, anecdotally uh, some concerns that I continue to be uh, asked. And it's usually from the old timers uh, that's been around real estate for decades. And uh, they just cannot believe that we're not going to have period of high inflation, uh, you know, living through the late 70s and the 80s and with the amount of stimulus and the amount of debt. Can you speak a little bit about that, you know, respond a little bit more to, 
to that particular concern by sure, the people sure. that's been I, on it around the world. I, I totally understand it. I, I think I think everything that we learned, uh, at least I learned growing up, uh, that should trigger inflation is in place today. Maybe with a, just a few exceptions. The money supply thing, the you know the Fed uh, the Fed balance sheet, the actual growth in the money supply are really scary numbers. And Milton Friedman famously said that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. In other words, too much money chasing too few goods. The, the issue in the US today, and I've actually asked people that I, that I know like worked at the Fed and things why this is happening. The, the velocity of money in the United States is very, very low. It's been falling for over a decade now. It fell after the financial crisis and it just continued to fall. So in other words, how quickly money turns over in the, in the banking system, our, our marginal uh, reserve banking system, uh, fractional reserve. Um, and nobody seems to be able to explain it much. Um, but it's hard to get inflation without the money turning over in the, in the conventional ways. So that's one thing. Um, I grew up, you know, I, I, was, I was a teenager in the, in the 70s. I remember getting up and taking the car uh, to get in line for the gas when the embargo happened and all that stuff. And, and inflation, it was, it was a really scary thing. We, we don't have those same sort of structural shortages uh, anymore. Um, certainly not in energy. The United States is the largest producer of carbon. So those type of things really aren't in place. And that, that sort of leaves you with the wage price spiral phenomena. Um, again, structurally in the 70s, a very large share of our labor force was unionized. So when there was higher inflation, they were able to successfully negotiate for higher wages, which of course led to higher inflation and so on. Um, that really isn't the case today. Less than 20% of the US labor force is unionized. So you have a few sort of important things off the table. I guess the thing, if I was gonna be worried about inflation, the thing I would be worried about is the fact that really for the previous 20 years, we had strong deflationary forces globally coming out of the movement of production to lower and lower cost places like China and other places in Southeast Asia and so on. That really isn't the case anymore. I don't think, I don't think we're, we're not going back to hyper-globalization. We're probably not going back the other direction either to no globalization. But if we're not gonna uh, over-globalize, I guess we're, we're, we're not gonna have that, that deflationary force that we had in the last, um, the last 20 years. So, uh, you know, my, my expectation would be that inflation, we'll, we'll get through this disruption we've had, uh, the supply chain disruption, it'll work itself out. And then we'll be in an environment where, where inflation will run slightly higher than, than where it had been running. So in that two to two and a half percent range, but I'm sure we could get 10 people on the call here to give their opinion and we get at least 10 different opinions uh, about inflation. Um, there, if, if you don't mind me digressing for just a second, there's a really sure. funny, there's a funny story and it's, it, it's partially true, like a lot of these funny stories. And it's about Albert Einstein. Um, when he was still alive, he liked to know the IQ of people that he was, um, that he was talking to. Um, so he could tell what to talk to them about. So if he met somebody who was, you know, 160, he talked to them about physics. If it was 140, they talked politics or something. And apparently he met a man one night at a dinner party who said his IQ was 60. And he said to him, so what do you think inflation's going to do? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thank you. We do have one uh, question from the audience and thanks for your, uh, your narration there, your explanation. Uh, the question is, if you were coming out of school today, given the low return expectations, what sector of real estate would you go to? Oh, that's a great question. There's so many more choices today than there were, you know, when, when Barrett and I came along. Um, the, there's, the last 10 years or so, there's just been an explosion of emerging sectors they're really, in a lot of cases, they're subsectors of, of larger property types, things like cold storage and life science and data centers and um, um, single family for rent. And there's just, there's so many choices today, medical office. Um, I, I guess what I would say is find one that you're interested in for reasons other than it just being property in a, in a property sector. If you're really interested in sort of life sciences, that might be a great property sector to specialize in. If, you, if you're if you really into logistics and distribution, um, the cold storage area might be fascinating to be involved in. There's, there's just tons of opportunity in all of them because there's so few people that have a lot of expertise in them at this point. So it's, it's a wide open frontier for you. Um, I think the ones that have really strong 
sort of demographic thematic stories that go along with them, things related to the aging of the baby boom. Um, that would be medical office, that might be seniors living. Um, you know, those are places where you can have a lot of conviction, both right. in terms of your career, but also in terms of underwriting. Right. Thank you. Here's another question. Is there an optimal balance between price and interest rate that those in real estate investment space prefer? Well, um, again, great question. People like to see, um, well, if you're, so if you're developing, for example, you want to see a, a good um, spread between your return on cost and what you think uh, exit cap rates would be. So, you know, back in the good old days when interest rates are, were at some sort of normal level, you know, a number of people might look at what might've been 200 basis points or something like that. Today, these numbers are all distorted by how low interest rates themselves are. Uh, 50, you know, 50 basis points can be a really big pickup if you're starting at a low, a very low interest rate. So as I said before, when I was talking about, um, about the cap rate spread to treasuries, um, the absolute basis points will be important and people will talk about it and they'll quote things in those terms. But looking at these, these ratios, these multiples, if you will, of, of what your yield is to what underlying interest rates are, um, I think that's where most of our really sophisticated yield investors tend to look at it in that terms rather than absolute spread. Um, okay, thank you. Here's another one. Uh, what happens to values 10 to 15 years from now when bond yields have recovered and debt isn't as cheap? Well, a lot depends on how we get there. Um, so the first part of the, the, the premise, of course, in that question is, is that yields will no longer be, be low. Um, I, you know, again, everything I learned growing up, everything I learned in school would, would tell me that yields today can't stay this low, but yet they've been this low in Japan for 25 years. Um, so they, they can stay low for, for a very long period of time, especially if, if global growth is slower, just structurally slower. Um, I think we already see that in terms of population. Population growth is, is much slower than had been expected. I mean, you remember those books back in the 60s, Paul Ehrlich and people like that, the, the population bomb and all of that, that we were going to have massive over, uh, overpopulation of the world. And it, it just simply isn't happening as, as, as people become wealthier and more educated, they tend to have less children. It's just, it's played out almost everywhere in the planet. But leaving all that aside, if we do get to a point where interest rates are back to something, let's, let's say normal is, you know, 4% or 5% or something like that, and cap rates and borrowing costs are some spread above that, values will be impacted if property NOI hasn't grown enough to compensate for it. So it's really that simple. And um, there's a lot of reasons why you could expect strong NOI growth in different sectors. And there's, you could probably convince yourself of many, many reasons why that wouldn't happen. But the impact on values will be almost entirely a function of whether or not the NOI growth exceeded the increase in, in whatever rate you're using to discount that NOI. Great. Thank you. Another question. Given all the supply and demand mismatches we've seen in the past 18 months, what permanent effects do you think we'll see in the supply chain management? Oh, I think we're already seeing it. Um, there's, there's a lot more uh, what people are calling onshoring or reshoring, bringing production back um, to the United States or cert certainly somewhere closer in the global system. Um, this really goes back to, I mean, if you want to go all the way back, the place where we first noticed it was right after the Fukushima disaster in Japan when the nuclear reactor melted down and supply chain from Japan was disrupted for some period of time after that. And just a few months later, there was terrible flooding. I don't know if anyone remembers, but terrible flooding all through Thailand. Uh, the chip, the chip um, delivery system was really disrupted. And at that point in time, a lot of US manufacturers started the very beginning of switching from what at that time was called uh, just-in-time inventory, making someone else hold your inventory for you until you needed it, um, and then get it to you right as you needed it. And they all, a lot of them started switching to a, a system that they sort of uh, called just in case inventory, dual sourcing, tri sourcing. I think all of that is very much on people's minds today. I mean, you look, just look at Ford with all the F 150s that they have sitting idle because they can't get the chips for them. There's, there's supposedly 100,000 F 150s that can't be put onto dealers' lots today because they can't get the chips. There is a real, there's a real concern specifically in chips and electronics. 
um, maybe more so than some of the other categories. But the, just look at pharmaceuticals. Um, the United States was able to stand up uh, a vaccine effort really quickly because we produce vaccine here. Many other very advanced developed countries, countries like Japan and Australia and parts of Europe, they weren't able to stand that vaccine production up anywhere near as fast because they don't have that or didn't have that. So I think there's gonna be a lot of push in a lot of countries to produce more things uh, domestically. Um, and you know that that should that should be good for U.S. property. Um, yes. Okay. Thank you. Speak a little bit to the retail sector. One of your slides showed an uptick in the retail market, and then of course we've heard that Amazon has announced that they're going to be, start building yeah. brick and mortar stores. Um, has retail bottomed out? Um, I think retail's largely bottomed out, um, but not not all retail centers. Um, let's just go for the malls, for example. You know, in the United States, there's there's um, there's really high end Class A malls. There's middle market malls, and then there's a whole bunch of other stuff. There's a lot of properties that are functioning as malls today that really don't have a purpose. They're going to have to find a new a new purpose in life, a new a new use. That's a very painful process, right? The um, the current owners have to go through all those stages of grief and dying that Kubler Ross described. They have to, you know, sorrow and mourn and weep and all that. But eventually, the values are going to have to adjust on those to something that comes close to land value in order for them to be able to put into use as a different property type. So that that will happen. Um, a lot of um, a lot of retail stood up pretty well throughout this whole thing, um, particularly uh, grocery anchor necessity type retail. But even in there they did suffer some market share loss to, to the virtual supply chain, to people ordering groceries online, uh, having delivered direct to their homes. A lot of that was fulfilled out of the physical store because uh, most, most grocery chains weren't set up to do um, home delivery uh, quickly and they had to do it out of their stores. I think going forward, they're gonna try and do more of that out of other locations, locations that are more efficient uh, for, you know, if you've been to a grocery store lately, you, you, I'm sure you've run into a bunch of young people doing picking uh, with grocery carts. They're running around the store with lists, getting the things that are being ordered and then having to fill boxes and bags and trucks and all that sort of thing. It's just not very efficient to try and do that in your existing store format with that, while your other shoppers are uh, milling about. So I think a lot of that's going to move. Um, we've seen really strong growth in the cold storage, cold chain. Um, we've, we've been very active in that space. It's a combination of this phenomenon that I'm talking about, but also just many more products that need temperature control. Uh, again, pharmaceuticals, things like film and candles, flowers. Flowers are probably the most uh, perishable item uh, we have today um, in our supply chain. Um, so as more and more demand comes for perishable items, there's gonna be much more growth in cold storage demand as well. Interesting, thank you so much. We just have a, a couple of minutes left, Mike, mm -hmm. and. Uh, we just can't thank you enough for taking time today to share with us. You've always been so kind uh, to us uh, here in the Intermountain area. Uh, we've got students on the call as well. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, they are looking to the future in a little bit. And is there any particular uh, advice or thoughts, particular sectors, anything that you could maybe uh, would like to share with them as they get ready to pursue a career in real estate? Sure, it's a great question. And thank you, Barrett, again, for inviting me. It was really great to be able to kick off your series this fall. And I'm really looking forward to getting out to the area in person again, as soon as that's uh, possible. Um, so students, um, congratulations. You're, you're back in, presumably you're back in class and, and uh, on campus and all of that. And you made it through, like we all did through the pandemic year. Um, as far as your career and going forward, I mean, we touched on just a minute ago, some of the niche sectors. I do think that's something to very much think about because you can become you can become an expert in one of those areas and very quickly um, be a leader uh, because there's there's such nascent uh, property sectors. But but abstracting beyond that, I would say that there's two things today that almost everybody is looking for more of and having a really hard time finding anything to do with ESG and R resiliency, so environmental, social governance. Um, that is in huge demand today. Uh, the data I've seen suggests that maybe as much as half of all institutional capital today is being managed relative to some sort of ESG 
mandate screening, uh, so, some sort of um, benchmarking scheme. So to the extent that you can develop skills and present yourself as um, an asset in any one of those categories or more than one, that would be ideal. Uh, everyone's looking for that today. And then the other thing is, is somehow um, uh, enhancing your data science skills. The real estate industry is going through an explosion of growth in property tech companies, prop tech, they call it. Um, enormous amounts of new data becoming available all the time. Most of it is very real time. And we're all struggling with trying to figure out how to use it, how to make it meaningful. Um, just simple example, we're using, we're using cell phone tracking data at all of our shopping centers to see not only foot traffic in the center, but to see where those customers came from and where they went to after they left our center. And it really helps us with making decisions about what sort of tenant we should be putting in the center when a space becomes available. Recently, we've figured out how to use that same data to look at a warehouse to figure out where the workers come from. That's a huge issue in warehousing today, enough labor. And to look at an apartment building to see where those residents work. Again, an important issue for underwriting uh, apartments. So that's just one simple example. But if you can develop your skills and present yourself as an expert in some portion of data science, that's all to the good. And ESG is going to be, um, I want to call it a, it's a, it's a, a green field for a long time to come. No, no pun intended there. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Mike, once again. Uh, to our audience, we uh, appreciate you joining us today. We uh, hope that you have a wonderful afternoon. And we'll see you in two weeks where, uh, when we'll host Julie Kilgore from Wasatch Environmental. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.